Good evening. I'm Joshua Johnson. It is Friday, July 8th, and here's what we're talking about tonight. Police in Japan say a makeshift gun killed former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. We'll examine what he meant to Japan and what his assassination could mean for this weekend's national election. The Supreme Court's ruling on Roe v. Wade is prompting more pushback nationally and internationally. We'll break down President Biden's new executive order and see how lawmakers in Europe are now pushing to increase abortion rights there. Also tonight, renowned basketball coach Don Staley joins us to discuss Brittany Griner. The WNBA star was on Staley's Olympic team, and now she's in Russian custody fighting for her freedom. Plus, Elon Musk is breaking his deal to buy Twitter. But the social network says the deal's a deal. So why cancel the buyout? And will the government let him do it? And an especially contagious COVID variant is now America's dominant strain. Is it time to get that booster shot? We'll get you caught up on the Omicron variant, BA5. Well, we're starting again tonight with news about a prime minister, this time with an assassination in a country that has almost no gun violence. Japan's former prime minister Shinzo Abe was killed in broad daylight, attacked during a political rally. Japanese voters will not have much time to grieve. National elections are this weekend. Before we get to that, let's begin in Washington and the latest in the fight over abortion rights. Today, President Biden signed an executive order to protect abortion access. It's part of the administration's response to the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. We cannot allow an out-of-control Supreme Court working in conjunction with extremist elements of the Republican Party to take away freedoms and our personal autonomy. The choice we face as a nation between the mainstream and the extreme between moving forward and moving backwards, between allowing politicians to enter the most personal parts of our lives and protecting the right of privacy. Meanwhile, more states are banning abortions. In Louisiana, which you see marked on the map in yellow, a state judge allowed its ban to go into effect today. A number of other states plan to enact their bans in the coming days and weeks. How does this executive order affect that, if at all? Joining us now is Professor Rachel Rebouchet, the interim dean of Temple University's Beasley School of Law in Philadelphia. Dean Rebouchet, welcome back. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Can you give us your analysis of this executive order, what it does and what it does not do? So it's a pretty broad order, like many executive orders are, and it sets out the commitments that the Biden administration would like to make in securing abortion access where it's legal. It doesn't make inroads in states where abortion would be banned, although it makes a mention of securing access to a medication abortion where it can. So in this way, this is a nod potentially, though very subtle, to an argument that FDA policy, the federal administration that approves drugs for safety and efficacy for their effectiveness, is uh, when it issues its policy, that preempts state laws. It's a novel theory, it's controversial in some ways, but that's one way in which this executive order might hint at future action to advance abortion access in, in different ways. Explain that theory a little bit further, because if we look at just a list of some of the things that are mentioned in this executive order. It mentions boosting access to reproductive health care services, access to emergency medical care, family planning, promoting patient privacy and access to accurate information and coordinating federal efforts. The federal efforts piece I get because that is in the president's executive authority as the president of the United States, the head of the executive branch. But all of these other things like boosting access to reproductive health care services Access where? Like, he can't right. tell Texas what to do with its laws under this Supreme Court ruling. So I'm, I'm just wondering if there are parts of this executive order that are sort of legally toothless because of the nature of the Supreme Court rulings. So, yeah, the, the Health and Human Services isn't going to march into Texas with uh, an army of abortion providers that are going to thwart Texas law. But uh, federal law does speak to abortion. 
And where federal law has set out, for instance, the duty of healthcare providers to provide emergency care, including abortion care, uh, if there's an emerging emer emergency medical situation, well, then they're required to do that by statute. Um, if there is a federal duty, as there is under HIPAA, uh, to not disclose patient health information, to keep that private, unless you have a subpoena or some other legal document, um, the federal government can enforce that. So a little bit of what's being touched on in this executive order are the federal laws that would preempt in the, just as I just, you know, the art, what we were just uh, talking about, state laws that would be contrary or might undermine those federal policies. Is this setting up another set of court fights over abortion? It almost sounds like the president is, is kind of creating another inroads to fight about abortion another way on a different set of federal statutory grounds, which sounds like this is never going to end. <laughs> I agree with you. Um, I'm not sure that the executive order sets it up, but I think you're absolutely right. What we can expect moving forward is an increasingly complex legal landscape, not just fights between states, some states that want to protect people, some states that want to extend their policies past their borders, but between the federal government and states. The federal government has powers to enforce its policies and uh, enforce its laws across a number of different areas. Privacy is one of the areas mentioned in the executive order, as we talked about patient information, emergency situations, and we can expect states to resist. So there, I think we have just seen the tip of the iceberg of the legal complexities that are to come. Can I ask you to chime in on a few other things before I have to let you go? One of them has to do with information. We know that a number of cities and states are already moving toward banning law enforcement there from cooperating with interstate investigations over people who've provided abortion services. Mutual aid in law enforcement is something that's at the discretion of that agency. So that seems like something they could do. They could be like, hey, if you want to catch, you know, abortion fugitives, good luck, do it yourself. We're not going to help. That seems legally defensible. Some of the other ideas, like, for example, putting abortion clinics on federal lands seem possible, but it feels like there's also a thousand ways that a state could frustrate that. If you wanted to do that in Oklahoma on federal lands, I could see Governor Stitt saying, well, I don't know where you're going to get power, water, and sewer, because we're not providing them <laughs> as a state. It feels like, you know what I'm saying? It just feels like there's so many ways for different levels of government to frustrate one another in the implementation of either abortion services or abortion bans? I, you know, move, counter move. Uh, we're going to see a lot yeah. of, this is, go, this is what's going to create a lot of the complexity, uh, these flickering legal statuses. So I, I agree on the federal lands point. Uh, there are pieces of land in which the federal government have exclusive jurisdiction, which means that federal law is law that applies. It's not state criminal law. Um, and so state abortion bans couldn't necessarily be enforced on those pieces of property. But the logistical difficulties of getting people on and off federal land, the second you step foot in back into a state, the state can pass all manner of laws uh, to thwart your access, to punish, to penalize, and the like. Um, but, you know, another form of resistance, though, DAs, governors, uh, states that have said, we are not cooperating in the prosecution of abortion-related crimes. Missouri, if you want to try to pass a law that punishes providers for providing abortions in New York, we, New York, have passed a law that says we're not going to issue subpoenas, we're not going to extradite, we're not going to participate. Right. Um, EAs in Austin saying something similar. So the levels of uh, uh, complexity and the different types of power uh, at play and the scope of power, these people are acting within their legal competencies, but they are raising truly uh, interesting and complicated issues of of, of cooperation, frankly, that we've taken for granted for decades. Rachel Rebouche, the interim dean of Temple University's Beasley School of Law in Philadelphia. Dean Rebouche, we appreciate you talking this through with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.
The Supreme Court's ruling on Roe has drawn some very strong reactions, including from America's European allies. Yesterday, the European Union's parliament overwhelmingly passed a resolution condemning the ruling. On top of that, it's calling for the EU's charter to be amended to include abortion as a right. The European Union has 27 nations. Most of them have national abortion protections. The resolution expresses concern about the Supreme Court decision sparking a surge in funding to anti-abortion movements in Europe. So what impact could this move from the EU's parliament have? And how does it affect Europe's relationship with the U.S.? Let's get into that with Lawrence Gostin, faculty director of Georgetown's O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. Professor Gostin, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. What do you make of this decision by the EU parliament to formally call out a branch of the American government over this ruling on abortion rights? Well, you know, it's very consistent with what, you know, the world has been echoing about ever since the ruling. Um, most of our allies, the UK, Boris Johnson, uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, in France, uh, Justin Trudeau in Canada, and even the UN Secretary General's Office and the Human Rights Commission um, have criticized this. And so I think you, the US has become an outlier and people are afraid, frankly, that uh, US influence could roll back the clock for, for women's uh, rights and, and reproductive access uh, in countries around the world. And so they're scrambling to protect that. I wonder if perhaps there's some hope among EU parliament members who voted for this resolution that they can kind of have a backwards influence on the U.S. I mean, Europe has already in, is already influencing the U.S. in some policy areas, mostly with tech, with the GDPR, this general data protection regulations. If you, for those of you who are watching, if you've ever noticed that websites have more of those boxes that say, we're putting cookies on this website, is that okay? Please click accept before you go forward. That's because of a European regulation that American sites have to comply with. Is it possible, Professor, that Europe is hoping that because of their heft and their influence, that they can force some kind of influence on American businesses, enterprises that want to be active in Europe? Yeah, you're referring to the European uh, data protection um, uh, order, um, which does affect the United States. Now, normally, you know, you really find that the U.S. Supreme Court has been a great influencer around the world. And so it usually comes from the U.S. and it threatens other countries or, or protects them, depending upon what the ruling is. It doesn't usually come the other way around. Yes, I think there's a hope, you know, in European leaders that, that this would affect them. But let's put this all in perspective, if we can. You know, since 1994, 60 countries around the world have expanded abortion access, including highly uh, uh, religious Catholic tradition countries like uh, Ireland. Um, at the same time, there's only been three countries around the world that have made things more restrictive. Now the U.S. is a fourth, and those are all, you know, really, you know, somewhat repressive states. Uh, places like uh, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Poland. Um, and so the U.S. is an outlier, and I really do uh, worry, and I think governments around the world worry, worry that this is going to embolden anti-abortion um, advocates and legislators around the world. And so they're trying to really shore up their defenses. And yes, they would love to be able to influence the United States, but we, we tend to go our own way, unfortunately. You know, in Europe, for example, you know, abortion is is rare and is rarer than it is in the United States. And they provide services yeah. to young moms um, to, to, to help support um, children. And so the United States Supreme Court's decision was really an extreme decision by international standards. I, I want to make sure, I know I have to let you go in just a minute, but I, I don't want to blaze past the point you just made, that we're not talking about apples to apples health care around the world, that American health care is very different as it relates to prenatal and neonatal care. And so the international view 
of abortion services is markedly different than a country like the United States with a very different health care system. I've only got a few seconds, but I just want to make sure I heard that point right. You heard it right. But in addition to that, there's, you know, help with um, child care. There's help with um, finances. Uh, there's social support, mental health support for young women. That doesn't exist in the United States. Professor Lawrence Gostin of Georgetown University, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. World leaders are sending their condolences after the assassination of Shinzo Abe. Japan's former prime minister was shot dead at a campaign event. It happened in the western city of Nara, near Kyoto, around 11.30 a.m. local time. It was just a few hours after last night's show ended. Fair warning, we have video of the assassination, but it is rather disturbing. Mr. Abe was shot twice in the chest and the neck. He was airlifted to a hospital with no vital signs and pronounced dead hours later. Shinzo Abe was 67 years old. He had been Japan's longest running prime minister. Mr. Abe was a conservative member of Japan's Liberal Democratic Party. Police tackled and arrested the alleged shooter, Tetsuya Yamagishi, at the scene. Officers say the suspect confessed to this crime and used what they described as a homemade gun. Joining us now is Cecile Shea. She's a non-resident fellow in global security and diplomacy for the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Ms. Shea, welcome. Good to have you with us. Nice to be here, but too bad it's not such a sad day. A very sad day for Japan and also for the current Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida. He gave a statement earlier remembering his predecessor, Prime Minister Abe. Here's part of what Prime Minister Kishida said. え、for those of you listening on the podcast, he said, I was desperately praying for him to survive, but unfortunately that prayer was not answered, and we now face this sad news. I have no words. I would like to express my deep condolences. Cecile Shea, take us back to before the shooting happened. If I wanted to have Shinzo Abe speak at my campaign event, right, for the elections that are ha happening on Sunday... What do I want him to speak for? What am I expecting him to convey? What feelings do I want him to evoke? What kind of halo effect do I want to get by being associated with Shinzo Abe? Well, that's a good question. Even though Japan really has had one ruling party for most of its post-war history, that, uh, that party, the Liberal Democratic Party, has a lot of factions. And by appearing in person with um, Mr. Abe, you would be showing that you are a part of Abe's faction, and more importantly, that you have his endorsement, that, um, that the things that Abe supports and believes in around the world are things that you would also support and believe in. The interest in this election has, has reportedly been quite low, so one of the reasons that you would want someone as well-known and popular as Abe to appear with you is you need voter turnout. Um, and, and I suspect that that's what's going to happen now. There would have been very low voter turnout, but I, I suspect that this incident is going to mean people are going to go to the polls and, and go ahead and vote, even though the, the result is pretty much foreordained. Um, looks like the Li Liberal Democratic Party will retain its stronghold on government. There have been a number of statements from world leaders, one of which we just got in the last few minutes, a joint statement from the Quad leaders, from President Joe Biden, uh, Australia's Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, all mourning Prime Minister Abe. They refer, to, they refer to him working tirelessly to advance a shared vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. And they end by, read, by saying, quote, we will honor Prime Minister Abe's memory by redoubling our work towards a peaceful and prosperous region, unquote. What's the legacy mm -hmm. of Shinzo Abe? Where did he make his mark the most strongly? 
Well, you know, first of all, think about the participants in that quad statement. You have Australia, which suffered terribly in World War II. You had the United States, which lost an enormous percentage of its own servicemen um, in the Pacific theater of the war. And you have India, which also suffered during World War II. And, and here they were willing to work with um, Japan to try to bring security to Asia. And one of Abe's real successes through his term, first of all, he was just successful staying in power. Uh, no matter how much vision or strategic um, understanding any prime minister of Japan may have had in the past, most of them were never in power long enough to be able to institute the kinds of changes and relationships that were necessary. Not only did Abe have a huge and broad strategic understanding of the region, of the economy, of the security climate, he also was politically brilliant and extremely compelling, extremely charismatic. And that enabled him, first of all, to stay in power for 10 years, and secondly, to form really deep relationships with his fellow leaders around the world and to work with them toward his vision really toward many people's vision of the region. And so the fact that, for instance, he and uh, the Australian government have worked so closely together in recent years is extraordinary. Right. I remember really 15 years ago, the Australians were still not comfortable allowing Japanese forces to, to um, exercise in Australian waters. Before I have to let you go briefly, I have to note the fact that Japan has such amazingly low gun violence. If you look at the figures from last year, 10 shootings, one death in all of Japan. In the U.S., we had almost 700 shootings that killed nearly 21,000 people across the country. Japan is obviously a smaller country population-wise, but very briefly, Cecile, I don't know what this does for the psyche of a country that is so used to not even having to think about guns at all. Well, and, and not just guns, there's very little crime, period, in Japan. It's really extraordinary yeah. as an American to be able to walk around there all alone at three in the morning and not worry. I mean, I never once worried about my physical safety, that my purse might be lifted. It just doesn't happen in Japan. You know, it was a gun. It wasn't a purchase gun. It was a homemade gun. Um, the people are in shock over just losing Abe. But I think one of the lessons that we can see today is that you know, when you have a homemade gun like this, you can do damage. But it's just so different than the situation we had in, here in the Chicago suburbs on July 4th, where a man with a high-powered rifle in the course of a minute can ruin dozens of people's lives and take six, seven, eight lives. So, um, you know, the gun control in Japan has worked, in point of fact. Uh, there are very few shootings, and, and when they do occur, they do not occur with military-type weapons. Cecile Shea of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Appreciate, appreciate you sharing your insights with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me. Up next, the Twitter buyout is over, at least according to Elon Musk. We'll dig into the details of the SEC filing terminating Musk's $44 billion deal. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. Elon Musk seems to no longer be interested in buying Twitter. Twitter, on the other hand, says it's willing to sue Musk and see the merger through. Today, in a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Musk team claims that Twitter executives, quote, have not complied with its contractual obligations, unquote. Twitter says it's not buying it, and it plans to see Mr. Musk in court. Twitter's chairman, Brett Taylor, tweeted, the Twitter board is committed to closing the transaction on the price and terms agreed upon with Mr. Musk and plans to pursue legal action to enforce the merger agreements, unquote. Let's get into all of that and the latest economic news about the job market with CNBC senior analyst Ron Insano. Ron, let me start with this Twitter deal. I hate to say I told you so, <laughs> but We're all I there. gotta say, yeah, I mean... Elon Musk has hemmed and hawed over this deal almost since he announced it. So the idea that he would say, ah, you didn't give me the data I wanted, feels predictable. Especially the reason, Ron, that he says Twitter's not holding up its end of the obligation about how many users Twitter actually has and how many are just bots. So he's invoking what we call in the merger and acquisition business the adverse uh, material adverse conditions clause, which is an escape hatch that everyone puts into a takeover or merger deal uh, agreement that if there is some material change in the business or some missing piece of information that is material to the future of the business, the buyer has the right to back out. 
Now, clearly, everyone knows that there are bots on Twitter. Everyone knows that people with multiple millions of followers, uh, which he even included, I believe, the former president, have a, a great number of bots rather than actual humans following them. So that this comes to a, as a surprise to the world's richest man strains credulity just a bit. Uh, clearly, we were never sure he really wanted it, and this confirms it. I will say, though, I mean, regardless of, of Elon Musk's motivations and, and this escape hatch, social networks have been cagey about the actual oh, sure. impact of bots and spam on their networks. I mean, it's one of the big complaints about Twitter. It's something that Facebook has had to go back and forth in terms of substantiating the numbers. It's one of the concerns about the influence of TikTok and surveillance on networks like TikTok and Instagram. Like, there are yeah. legitimate questions well, to be asked about TikTok. how much of what we see is real. Yeah, TikTok's a little different because there are national security concerns there with respect to how much data gets yes. shared with the Chinese government, right? So uh, Twitter, less so. But yeah, listen, we all know this. This is not news to anybody, uh, that, that there are bots, that there's misinformation, that there are a whole host of things uh, in where you can game uh, audience sizes, following sizes, and the lot. The, the, the fact, again, that a sophisticated technologist like Elon Musk was... Uh, you know, somewhat unaware or less aware than he should have been means a couple of things. Number one, he didn't do sufficient due diligence on the company before he made the bid. And, and number two, he, he, we were never entirely certain that he wasn't just playing a game for his own amusement, which many observers who know him well have suggested that he likes to rattle cages. He likes to play with the SEC and do things that are a little bit outside the lines at the very least. And so we were never entirely sure of his motivation, his conviction. Uh, and, and now, you know, should this go uh, to court and, you know, countless lawyers will be involved. He has a $1 billion breakup fee he's supposed to pay uh, to Twitter. Uh, if he doesn't go through with the deal, he may want a lower price from $54.20 a share. Stock's down 7% after hours tonight. We really don't know what's going on here other than to, to surmise that he may never have been entirely serious about this process. Briefly, before we talk about jobs numbers, could the SEC or the courts force Elon Musk to buy Twitter? To buy it, well, listen, he can always pay the billion dollar breakup fee, you know, and, and walk away. He may be trying to get that negotiated down and, you know, Twitter could walk away with 500 million in cash or something along those lines and say, listen, yeah. you know, why put all our people through this? Um, yeah, that, they're committed to closing the transaction. They have to say that. There's a lot of legal boilerplate in that as well because they accepted the offer. Um, but, you know, they may also be holding out for the billion dollars. He may be wanting to get it down when it comes to the breakup fee. And again, they also probably want at some juncture to create some certainty for their employees and their users. I have burned all my time talking about Twitter when I needed to ask you about the jobs <laughs> report also. The U.S. economy added 372,000 jobs in June. The expectation was about a quarter million. Unemployment is 3.6 percent. Private sector has 140,000 more jobs now than it did in February 2020, just before the pandemic hit, government jobs are still down well over 660,000 since 2020. Well, how does this report factor into concerns over inflation and over recession? Well, we, we think inflation is beginning to roll over. Uh, while, while we might be in the midst of a technical recession where growth in the first and second quarters turn negative, um, we have not seen an upturn, as, as you rightly note here, in joblessness. And so we're, I, we're in a technical recession. The Fed's likely going to raise rates by three quarters of a point this month because the economy is this strong. Wage inflation actually moderated last month in this report. Inflation's starting to slow down. Uh, my, my personal desire is for the Fed to do one more, stop, look and listen, and see what's going on in the economy be doing, before doing too much and, and creating a real recession that we would feel more acutely than just this kind of technical slowdown we've seen in economic growth in the first six months of the year and the downdraft in the financial markets as well. CNBC's Ron Insana. Always good to see you, sir. Thank you very much. As well. Thanks, Josh. We will get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including the man who spent more than eight hours talking to the January 6th committee today. Also, the next installment of our feature report on justice and mercy. Tonight, we'll dive into what it takes to expunge a crime from your record. And still ahead, a conversation with Brittany Griner's former Olympic coach, Don Staley, joins us ahead.
The January 6th committee continued its taped interviews today with someone whose name has come up a lot lately. No wonder they spoke for about eight and a half hours. It was former President Trump's White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. He previously met with the committee informally back in April. But House investigators subpoenaed him with renewed urgency after last week's testimony from former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson. She described him as a key player on the day the Capitol was attacked. I saw Mr. Cipollone right before I walked out onto West Exec that morning. And Mr. Cipollone said something to the effect of, please make sure we don't go up to the Capitol, Cassidy. Keep in touch with me. We're going to get charged with every crime imaginable if we make that movement happen. A source tells NBC News Pat Cipollone's testimony was cooperative, quote, within the parameters of his desire to protect executive privilege, unquote. Be sure to stay with us for the next hearing from the January 6th committee. It will be on Tuesday, July 12th. We'll have coverage here starting at 10 a.m. Eastern on NBC News Now. Time now for part two of our feature report, Justice and Mercy, about moving on from criminal convictions. In part one, we explored the presidential power of clemency. But courts can also clear one's record after one sentence is served. That's called expungement. And advocates say not enough ex-prisoners know about this option for starting over. What an expungement does is it's a legal proceeding that goes back to the court that convicted the person, and they just erase all the records. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all here today to our uh, record expungement clinic and community career fair. Nothing's automatic when it comes to government. So we started hosting these clinics so that we could take down the barriers for folks. If someone has a felony, you can't just go work in a hospital or you can't go work in a healthcare facility. If you get a waiver and expungement, that can take your, your earning potential from $15 to $32 to $45, which can be life changing for your family. But it's going to take six or eight months because courts are slow. That it's going to open up a lot of doors to them that were not you know, previously available to them. Employment, housing, voter rights, student loans. There's so many that, you know, again, stop folks from really having upward mobility in their communities. We look at the root of, like, what's causing all this and how we can, you know, assist in, in fixing these problems. It, goes, it all goes back to expungement and clearing those records. This being uh, an underserved uh, area of the Chicago area, we go into that area and the people are made aware that this expungement clinic is available. And what they'll do is they'll come to me and I'll sit down with them and go over what convictions they have and fill out all the paperwork necessary for a lawyer to represent them to the court, to convince the court to erase their conviction. How long ago was your sentence over? Uh, 2015. Okay, so it's been seven years. Seven years. And you're still getting effects of it? You, you've been denied uh, jobs you applied for because yes, of it? Yes, sir. Like what kind of jobs? You can't get into anything federal. You just, it holds you back from a lot of good things that you can't get done. So I'm trying to get that off my record so I can move on with my life. Uh, I'm still actually working on trying to uh, clear myself of a felony in which I obtained in uh, 1994. Wow. And the difficult part with that is, for some odd reason, it's hard to get rid of these, rid of these uh, felony convictions. You know, that conviction was for uh, possession of a, a stolen motor vehicle. So there was nobody hurt? Nobody hurt. <laughs> uh, I didn't kill anyone. I didn't savagely beat anyone. Uh, no domestic terrorism. You know, just a simple possession of a motor vehicle. Wow. And that one, you're, you're still struggling. I'm, to I'm get still cleared, struggling huh? to get that clear. And, it, and it's a shame. We're all human. So I meet people where they are and let them know that it's okay. We can talk about it, especially when it comes to resume and interviewing skills. Because you can get them prepared, but they got to go the rest of the way. And a lot of that is um, building up confidence within that person. 
more people need to understand that there are these services available and they should take advantage of them. If you've been out of the workforce for a long time, we will help you get started, how to interview everything to get you back. The success rate is actually very good as long as you are committed to the process. Right now is a great time to look for jobs. Everyone's hiring. That pandemic really shattered everything. You lost a lot of drivers. They had uh, drug driving. They had a lapse in their driver's license. The state will cover that. That, you know, to say, hey, okay, we send a waiver. A lot of times people say, well, I can't find work because I have a background. There are lots of people that will work with you and definitely companies that have forgiveness. I employ a lot of folks from those communities that have been in prison, that were ex-gang members, uh, gang leaders, and it's real important that they're relatable to that community because that's the only way that folks will come out to events like this. So me now today is being an example for the youth. You know, actions speak louder than words. Me getting caught up into that gang life, into that criminality, you know, it all starts with poverty, broken home, dysfunctional family, not having that, that role model. You, 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 you see what I'm saying? In your life. I decided that being broke and homeless on the street was better than being rich in prison. So I made my mind up that uh, going back into the game was, was not an option for me at all. We have to get in the mindset of, of, of working hard. You know, hard work pays off. Give a little more, because when you give a little more, you're gonna get a little more. And you look up a year or two down the road and then people be wondering how did you get to where you at. Getting this record off of you, what, what differences will it make in your life? Well, it would, it would take a huge burden off of me. You know, I am not the individual I was some 30 years ago. What are your plans, you know, when, once you're reinstated? You know, I mean, what, what's your first step? Honestly, if they, if they, if they do expunge it and seal it, my first thing is I'm going to go celebrate. Because <laughs> it'll finally be off my record. Thanks to our producer, Sean Crowley, and editor David Hall for that report. And if you missed part one of our Justice and Mercy feature, you can find that on social media. We are at NBC Now Tonight. Coming up, renowned basketball coach Dawn Staley joins us next. We will talk to her about one of her former Olympic athletes, Brittany Griner, and the push to get her out of Russia. Dawn Staley is just ahead. Stay close. The WNBA All-Star Game is in Chicago this weekend. Noticeably absent from this year's festivities is Brittany Griner, a seven-time All-Star athlete. She's still detained in Russia after pleading guilty to drug charges. Today, the Reverend Al Sharpton held a rally in her support. Also in attendance was Brittany Griner's wife, Sherelle, as well as WNBA players and executives. In her speech, Sherelle addressed the letter that President Biden wrote to Brittany Griner. It brought me so much joy, as well as BG. I believe every word that she said to him, he understood, and he sees her as a person, and he has not forgotten her, which was her biggest cry in her letter. So I'm grateful and I'm thankful that the administration that was the first one that BG ever voted for took the time to see her as a person, to see her in the midst of what she's going through and to speak to me directly and let me know that they are exhausting all efforts to bring her home. Joining us now is Dawn Staley, the head women's basketball coach of the South Carolina Gamecocks. She's also a three-time Olympic gold medalist and a former coach of Brittany Griner's. Dawn Staley, welcome. It's great to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Joshua. Thanks for having me. First of all, could I just ask, how are you doing tonight? I know it must be hard to see Brittany Griner in Russia and, and dealing with the legal system there. How have you been dealing with that? Well, actually, the, the last couple of days have been great. Um, obviously, the commu communication with uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris um, reaching out to Brittany um, after she sent her 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 letter. Um, I slept a little bit better the last couple of nights, but I know moving forward, we'll, we'll, we'll see some more nights in which we we will have to adjust and pivot and, and do what we we do. Um, in the like we do in the in the sport of basketball, where if things aren't going your way, you pivot and you you figure things out. 
Um, I'm just praying for Brittany that she will be able to just stay sane throughout this process. I hope she can settle in um, as to where she is and, and just deal with the moment as they come. But I hope she knows that we are working tirelessly um, and fighting for her freedom and for her to be released from, uh, uh, from Russia. Let me play another clip from the rally. This is Neka Agumake, who is the president of the Union for WNBA Players. Here is how she described Brittany Griner. Watch. What America needs to understand is that she is you too. She is the fun aunt. She is the wife who encourages her spouse to thrive. She's a daughter who celebrates her dad's service on the 4th. She's the kid who was bullied and a role model who stands up for those kids now. She is kind and she is all of ours. Don Staley, tell me about Brittany Griner from your perspective. What is she like? What was it like to, to work with her? Um, I mean, she was every bit of what Neka Ogumake said. Um, she's funny. I mean, she would give the shirt off of her back. Um, and knowing Brittany, she probably doesn't have a shirt on, so she's going to give you something. Um, <laughs> she's she's a voice for the voiceless. Um, she is one that, you know, she looks out for young people. She gives sneakers to the homeless and the needy. Um, she is she's a great teammate. She's an enforcer. Um, she's an American. She's an Olympian. She is exactly what NECA says. She is one of us, and um, sometimes I... I I see some of the comments in my on my social media posts, and it's you know some of the people that spew some of the things that you know that's being said out there. Um, I, I hope they know that that she's God's child and she is covered. She is going to come home to us, and she is going to tell her story one day. And why have you here? I hope that all the media outlets um, treat this like she's going to give them the first interview when she gets out. And if if you all treat her like that, this would be on every single day. This would be part of the ticker every single day. So um, for when it's not on in, in the public's eye, we, her foot soldiers, be, will be out there posting, will be out there calling um, the White House right. and calling everybody else out that can help. Well, you know, you were one of about 1,200 prominent black women who signed a letter to President Biden in support of bringing Brittany Griner home. There's been some talk that if this was an NBA player, if this was, you know, LeBron, or if this was Stephen Curry, you know, that, that there would be a very different cultural conversation about what's happening now with this kind of international standoff. I, I know that we've been paying attention to the story rather avidly, but how do you see that piece of it in terms of whether or not enough attention is being paid or enough is being done within the limited means the U.S. has, but whether enough is being done to bring her home. Right. Well, I I'm going to choose to put my energy into bringing BG home. I I'm not going to compare. Uh, my focus is on Brittany and what we need to do to bring her home. I think there are detractors, and that's one one of the detractors in getting us off the subject. And the subject is Brittany is being wrongfully detained in a Russian prison. I don't care who it would be. It, it, any American that's, that's on uh, abroad in her situation, we should be all fighting to get them home. We got ex-Marines. We got, you know, former diplomat, uh, diplomats. We got, you know, American citizens overseas um, that's being wrongly detained, and we need to do something about it. I know Brittany personally. I'm fighting for Brittany, but I'm fighting for every other American that's out there that is overseas, um, locked up, and, and, and I don't even know what kind of conditions. I don't even want to bring my mind to think about the conditions that they're in. I want them to come home. I want them to be with their loved ones. I, I want it to be a feel-good American story, just like we had with Trevor Reed. It's interesting how Brittany Griner's story has raised attention to the plight of other Americans who are in captivity, like Paul Whelan. I know his 
His sister Elizabeth and brother David were very upset for a while that they hadn't heard from the president directly, and now they have. So in a way, it almost seems like her story has sort of brought light to the plight of other people. Paul Whelan, by the way, has been detained since 2018 on espionage charges that he denies. I got to let you go in just a few seconds, but I, I'm just wondering, once Brittany Griner gets out and once she gets home, what do you plan to do when you see her for the first time? Uh, the hug, you know, the physical contact, because I know she doesn't get very much of it right now. Um, so we and, I, and the prayers. I'm going to keep praying for her, Brittany. I, I know that uh, Brittany, from a from a her mindset, she she's handling it. Obviously, she would want to be home, um, but I, I'm just going to rejoice and I'm going to thank God. I'm get on my knees and pray and thank God that uh, He brought her through this. Dawn Staley, I appreciate you taking some time out to talk to us about this very important subject, subject and this very important story. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are not out of the woods yet when it comes to COVID. We'll answer your questions on the BA5 Omicron variant before we go. A new version of COVID's Omicron variant is circulating around the U.S. Some doctors believe there is cause for concern. The BA5 subvariant is now the most dominant strain in the country. It accounts for nearly 54% of current cases. A similar subvariant, BA4, makes up about 17% of cases. Now, a new strain of COVID is nothing new, but what makes this one different? What does it mean for the vaccines we have and the vaccines that are on the way? NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now. And doctor, I wonder if we could start with a question from one of our viewers. Anna tweeted, how does this Omicron variant differ from the other Omicron variants? I'm fully vaccinated, but I need one more booster. Should I wait until the fall? Anna, thank you for those questions. Let's take them one at a time. First of all, how does BA5 differ from other Omicron variants? Yeah, Joshua, great questions from Anna. So BA5 is different because it's more infectious. Some estimate uh, the uh, kind of infectivity rate, meaning one person can infect a number of other people, is as high as 12 to 18 with BA5. So that's, Joshua, on level with measles, just to put it into some perspective. So as infectious as measles, the, what about the the vaccines that we, we have right now? I know there had been talk of trying to modify vaccines so that they were targeting BA4 and BA5 more directly. Yeah, that's correct. The FDA did issue that guidance to manufacturers just recently that they would like the updated vaccines that we can expect more likely later this year, November, December timeframe to be updated for BA4 and BA5. What that means is that the BA4 and 5 strains that are circulating, Joshua, can escape our current immunity. Our vaccines seem to still be holding against death and severe hospitalization which is a very good thing, but to the point that Anna's making and the question about whether she should wait, she should not wait for those vaccines later this winter because we have BA4 and 5 here now. And if you're due for a booster, it can make a difference and it can prevent you from ending up in the hospital, especially if you're older or have other chronic conditions. I want to underscore something you just said because you mentioned death and hospitalization. And I feel like a lot of people still think that a vaccine is a force field. And if you get immunized, that means you can't get it. Right. That was never what the vaccines were meant to do. They were not meant to keep you from getting infected. They were meant to keep you from getting killed, right? Yeah, that's right, Joshua. And look, let's, I, I think I've said to you very, hum kind of, I have my humility hat on 365. I think at the beginning, we were so excited to get these really high kind of efficacy rates, you know, these amazing numbers that we set this bizarre expectation that you would never get infected and nothing would happen. And that simply is not true. You're right. We're preventing the most serious outcomes, in this case, death, hospitalization. And we do see some progress with long COVID as well. When people are vaccinated and they still get infected, we have lower rates of long COVID than if they weren't vaccinated. And hey, if you've not yet been vaccinated, our site planyourvaccine.com is still up and it's got all kind of information on how to get immunized. You can do it quickly, quietly. Nobody but you and your doctor need to know. Planyourvaccine.com. Are we talking about different kinds of provisions that we should make in terms of symptoms to look out for 
or practices in terms of sanitizing surfaces? Like, are BA4 and BA5 changing the way we sort of live with the virus in general, or are they still pretty similar to what we're used to? Well, they're similar to what we're used to, except I mentioned the high infectivity, which means, Joshua, that you and I could be just casually sitting across from each other at a table, even outdoors if it's crowded. And if you're sick and you don't know it, you could obviously unintentionally give it to me because it's just that easy to give and get. In fact, I bet anybody watching or listening will tell you that they know a lot of people who are now sick who had avoided it in the last several months, meaning had you know a good summer, a good spring and now they've have COVID. So in terms of provisions, I think it's just getting back to basics. I know we're all exhausted. You don't need to overdo it, meaning you don't need to wear a mask 24 seven, but if you're in a crowded space, you're around strangers, Certainly, as we're all trying to get out for summer vacations, I want to remind people that in the airports, as you're boarding a plane or as you're exiting a plane, can be the most important places to wear a mask. Are masks effective against these new variants? Do they still work? Masks are. Yeah, that's the good news. If there, if there's good news to be had, is that vaccines still hold against the most, you know, dire outcomes, and that number two, the masks especially a high quality mask, which I think all of us have gotten used to, are still effective. Third piece of good news, Joshua, our current tests, even those home tests, still pick up these new variants. So all in all, we have these tools. It's just a question of whether or not we have the will to use them because we don't have these mandates or requirements in, in pretty much all of the country. I also want to alert people, we're seeing reinfections a lot sooner. People are getting reinfected and I don't want people to be surprised or think their vaccines failed, but it's because of these newer variants. It's actually easier to get reinfected, especially Joshua, if you had the original Omicron back in November and December, or even if you had COVID before this Omicron wave, very high possibility of reinfection. Gotcha. So definitely, if you have not yet been vaccinated, not yet been boosted, now is a good time to right. do it. No sense in no waiting time. until the fall. Dr. Kavita Patel, good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And hey, thank you for sending us your questions. Please keep them coming or send us your thoughts and questions on anything at all that we have discussed tonight. We are at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can always leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622, or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Jake Ward will be in the chair with you on Monday, but until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thank you for making time for us, and enjoy your weekend. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.